Good evening, everybody. Thank you very, very much for being here with us tonight. And the fact that you came in large numbers shows us how important and exceptional this evening is. Um, ten, days ago, uh, ten years ago, um, Bekim Seleku left this earth, but uh, left us with a, an amazing body of work, a beautiful art through music that we have been listening to um, regularly, many times playing for musicians. And uh, today there are still many, many young musicians who are revendica re revendicating the legacy of um, the heritage of Bekim Seleku. Uh, we're going to have a certain number of them in this room tonight playing, performing for you. Um, we, we thought that uh, as there was uh, a visit by a very dear friend of Bekim Seleku to Johannesburg, to South Africa, uh, that we heard of a few months ago, that it would be uh, a greatest honor to uh, organize an event uh, where we could celebrate his music and, uh, and interrogate and revisit his genius. Uh, I will introduce the people who are going to be participating in this event tonight. But uh, before do th we do that, um, I wanted to um, uh, give you a bit of a highlight of the um, development for this evening. We're going to start with a discussion uh, with a panel of, of, of six people, starting with the moderator for this discussion, who is also a staff of uh, the Vet School of Arts and uh, a renowned historian, a jazz historian, Dr. Lindelwa Dalamba who's going to be moderating, together with Gwen Hansel, who is probably the best uh, jazz journalist in this country at the moment and a uh, wealth of knowledge. Um, together with them is Eugene Scaife. Eugene Scaife was a dear friend of Bekim Seleku, lived uh, with him for many years in London and shared very personal and intimate moments uh, as a musician, as a friend. Uh, and so we'll hear a lot from Eugene about insights about uh, Becky's creative process and how generous he was in daily life. We also have Professor Salim Washington, who is hailing from Detroit in America, who is based for a number of years at the uh, University of KwaZulu-Natal and, and uh, teaching jazz um, at the UKZN School of Music, um, together with uh, Nduduzo Makatini, who is the also um, um, head of uh, music studies at Fort Hare University in East London, and will be performing tonight with his ensemble. And finally, but not least, uh, Africa Mkize, who uh, has agreed to come tonight and to play as well, and who is, as you know, a great disciple of Bekim Seleko. So please give a warm welcome to these panelists. Good evening, everybody. It's terrible when they take lectures out of the library, but there you are. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming to this really special occasion, um, celebrating a really sad moment, uh, but also talking through some of the things that we do need to reckon with when we speak about South African jazz and the South African musicians that we tend not to pay enough attention to while they're still alive. I just want to reiterate um, the importance of this occasion that is taking place in a university and that Members of the public are involved because we cannot keep our conversations solely within the classroom with our students because jazz does not belong in ivory towers, not that Vitz contains much ivory beyond pianos. <laughs> right, so today I'm very honored to have the panel that I have uh, with me. I tend to lure my students to these kinds of occasions by promising them that I shan't be speaking much because they hear enough from me in class and I will honor that promise today. Uh, following from you, uh, Emmerich's introduction, very generous introduction, I think it's very important that somebody like Bekim Seleku, who for an historian like myself, is far too recent to understand the times have not settled he died 10 years ago. I'm still trying to get to grips with jazz that was happening in the 1930s. So for this conversation to begin, it needs to include broad intellectual scholars such as Professor Salim Washington, people who have deep knowledge of the cultural politics of South African jazz and who are in the front lines of this glorious movement such as Gwen Ansel, 
we also need to pay tribute to the interpersonal relationships that sustain South African jazz history. Because it certainly has not been sustained by business. It was not sustained by the apartheid government. And one may argue whether it is being sustained now by our educational institutions, by our recording companies, by newspapers that give less and less space to arts journalism and music journalism. And so what keeps us knowing about these people is a matter of reciprocity and something that tends to be underplayed, which Plato didn't underplay, and that is friendship. And this is why having somebody like Eugene Skiff here is really something that we should not take for granted, and we thank you for visiting us, although we're not sure if you were just avoiding the English winter. <laughs> There's also another disturbing thing that seems to be happening in South African jazz, and it's understandable. It's the anxiety of preservation. Many of my students, my postgraduate students, are wanting to do transcriptions, transcriptions, transcriptions. Write it down, write it down. Because recordings have been lost. Yeah? We've lost our sonic archive. Compared to how much American jazz has been kept in vinyls, etc., etc., we have very little. But we can't stop at transcriptions because how musicians live beyond death is through use, through replaying, through interpretation. And this is why it's terribly important that we have two musicians who have done just that with Bekim Seleku. And those musicians are, of course, Duduzo Makatini with his distinctive hat, <laughs> and <laughs> Afrikam Kize. <laughs> with his distinctive trousers. <laughs> and so what we shall hear today is a variety of perspectives on this wonderful musician. What we're doing this evening is deconstructing something, and those of you who have asked this question will perhaps recognize what I mean when I say this. Whenever you say, what is it about Bekim Seleku? You get this, oh, Bekim, beautiful which tends not to be helpful to an historian. So today we'll be getting some words. And the words will never completely contain or explain, but it's a beginning. So welcome Hello. to everyone. Uh, yeah, really. So Professor Salim Washington is going to start us off. OK, hello, everyone. Um, Begin Seleku is a very interesting musician uh, from a number of, pr of perspectives. Um, and the one that I want to zero in, at least initially, is uh, Imseleko, the composer. Um, and it's easy to hear that he's a distinguished performer and improviser, a brilliant improviser. But as brilliant an improviser, he was also a brilliant composer. For me, um, he does a couple of things simultaneously. Um, he played both within South Africa and also as a resident outside of South Africa. So interestingly enough, he carries traits uh, of both groups, what I call the exiles and the exiles. And we can see this in his compositional practices, which I think is something that is significant and we, we, maybe we could talk more about that. Um, when I present his music to my students at UKZN, it's interesting. I start off with timelessness because for me, um, it, it's an extraordinary achievement, something that few people, it's almost like a Duke Ellington level achievement of writing for specific people. So like when he writes timelessness, to feature Joe Henderson, it is as though Joe Henderson wrote that tune, or though it was written especially for him. The same could be said of Yanini with Pharaoh Sanders. The same could be said for Through the Years with Abby Lincoln, with Amanata. It's like, there, there, there are not many composers, you don't need two hands to count the ones who can achieve something like that, where you write for a person something that they would have written for themselves if they had had those kind of chops. 
Uh, and, and Becky is this, is this kind of person. So it's interesting. He's of a generation of South African pianists where when you hear him play, you know he's from South Africa. And yet, uh, there are few musicians that have delved into the intricacies and the nuances of the African-American approach to jazz as Becky and Seleko, right? That's another thing that I never hear many people talk about, but I think it's something that's quite significant. When I put on Home at Last, though, um, my students begin to dance, they begin to sway. Even the ones who are not jazz students, they hear something that they don't necessarily hear in all of his work, which is interesting to me because he has found a way to hit a kind of mother load of South Africanness uh, and in his composition as well as in his playing practices. So I think uh, you have somebody who has an extraordinarily mathematical approach. Uh, he's primarily interested in harmonic cycles. Uh, and so the, the person that, that comes to mind most readily as a composer would be John Coltrane, who was equally enthralled with cycles. But interestingly enough, for me, Becky M. Seleko has a greater melodic gift than did John Coltrane. So there's a way in which he's playing these cycles, but they're masked by the beauty and the logic of the melodies, right? And then there's the way in, uh, I'm just making these comparisons, forgive me, some, someone uh, like a Thelonious Monk, where you can't just play run changes and play a, a monk tune, you'll, you'll sound stupid. To, uh, to, to, to be successful navigating that, you have to be aware of the rhythmic composition as well as the melodic composition as well as the harmonic composition. And I'm wondering about uh, M. Seleko's work in this way. Uh, he uses some surprising notes, notes that your uh, college theory teacher would tell you are wrong. You're not supposed to use this kind of note with that type of harmony. And yet he does it and no one will question it. No one's ear will reject what he did. And that, that is a gift. Uh, that's more than astute musicianship. That's, that's actually a melodic gift. And, and his rhythm was perfect. Um, and all of these elements can, can be analyzed, you know, like I, we're playing a, a song tonight, The Violet Flame, where he takes the Coltrane idea of moving in major thirds, but he moves it in the opposite direction of Coltrane, and he puts these Coltrane modulations within themselves. So there's three sections that move up in major thirds, but within each of these sections, there are these other major third movements that are going up, and it's very complex but it sounds so simple and beautiful and ethereal all at the same time. So I think it's time that we begin to analyze him as a composer. Yeah. Thank you, Salim. Uh, it always amazes me how excited people get about analysis. For me, it's always been homework. But I'd like us to keep in mind before we uh, open the floor later on, is what you're saying about him being equally cosmopolitan and significantly local, and how these so-called wrong notes become unquestioned. And I would suggest that they become unquestioned because Bekim Seleku's South Africanisms are not just coloristic. They're intrinsic to the logic of the music. So he's not putting on a beshu, yeah? He's not exoticizing himself. Yeah? What is South African in there is intrinsic to the logic of the music. Thank you. Um, following on Salim and surrounded by such musically knowledgeable practitioners, I'm not going to talk about the music. I just make a fool of myself. I'm going to talk about the Beggy that I knew. And I want to preface that by saying, Actually, make no mistake, if there is such a thing as a genius, in musical terms, Beggy was one. 
This afternoon, I was listening to Meditations, which is probably the least well-known, but the most beautiful of his albums. The solo recital he did at the 1992 Bath Festival. Um, the first track is 32 minutes long. The second track is 15 minutes long. I can't describe them. You need to listen to them. But I can't help thinking he'd be a little bit amused and find it a little bit ridiculous to have the concert titled with this grandiose, The Genius of Begi Masileku. Because when you talk to Begi, the thing he constantly stressed was the things we all have in common. Um, a favorite phrase when I knew him was to say, we're all earthlings. And that was something he liked to remind people of, particularly when there were disagreements or somebody's ego was getting in the way. And very deliberately, earthlings, rather than South Africans or Zulu-speaking people or even musicians, because not only do we all share humanity on this planet, but Beggy felt we needed to be mindful that there might be other entities out there waiting to jam with us on some other plane. Beggy was an Afrofuturist before that term got fashionable. I interviewed him three or four times in this country when he came back, but the time I got to know him best was in Botswana, in Gaborone, in late 1985, in fact, the second half of 1985, after the SADF raid, which murdered more than a dozen comrades, which destroyed the cultural structures of Medu that had made it such a culturally fruitful place. Um, Begi, Bani Rachabane, a number of other South African players had come in to make a recording with Hugh Masekela, but that was increasingly less what people wanted to do. After the raid, the nighttime stopped being a time of joy and rebellion and creativity. It became a time of apprehension and fear when you, you were terrified every time a car slowed down at your gate in the dark because you didn't know whether it was the Bura coming back or not. Um, and people were basically marking time, waiting for Hugh, who had left the country, to set up the next phase of a tour. So like all of us, Beggy became a gypsy. It wasn't safe to stay in one place for too long, so he'd crash here and he'd crash there like the rest of us did. When he had a gig, he'd hijack a clean T-shirt from one comrade in the house. He'd hijack some washing gear from somebody else. If he'd had a jacket, he probably left it somewhere else the previous night. None of that worried him. He'd say something like, people are good. Somebody's going to bring it back, or another one will be given. Why are you so worried about things? Things are heavy. They weigh you down. What's important is lightness. And he said that a lot. He wasn't a saint. He was a deeply spiritual person, but he had no patience for narrow, censorious, organized religion. I remember one evening when evangelists from some well-funded U.S. faith organization came knocking on the door. The rest of us wanted to chase them away because you never actually knew who those people were. Beggy said, no. He said, wait, watch. I'm going to mess with their heads. He didn't use the word mess. And he started such a high-level theological argument that by the end of it, those evangelists didn't know what planet they were on. <laughs> and the rest of us were absolutely paralyzed with suppressed laughter. For Becky, music and spirit were what photographer Val Wilmer called as serious as your life. But there was an irreverent, witty side to him too, and we shouldn't always remember him as someone sitting solemnly in a corner composing music. After a gig, Becky would charm his way past the security guards into the National Museum in Gaborone, which was the only place with a decent piano. Him and a bunch of other players, Botswana, South Africans, guys from the uh, Botswana army band who wanted to learn more, um, the occasional student, the remnants of Gwangwa's Shakawe and Masakela's Kalahari. And that's where another facet of his genius showed. Not only did musically amazing things happen, but Becky's midnight symposiums at the museum were part of the healing for all of us. It was really hard to hold fear when you were caught up in a debate on whether there could be any, this was the recurring theme, could there be any such thing as a new combination of notes 
or has everything been played before somewhere in the universe? It was impossible to surrender to those nightmares, listening to Becky analyze Train Solo from A Love Supreme, put it back together again as a duet for himself, one hand on the keys, the other on the saxophone, and then slide off the piano stool so somebody like Tony Sidras or a very good, now sadly late, Motswana pianist and journalist Rampolo Molefe, let's hear what they could make of it. It was all part of the sharing and the spreading of light and everybody, even me, who to this day cannot read a note of music, learned something from it. But the Becky I met subsequently was heavier and graver and sadder. And when I met him back here for one of the interviews, he said, why university wants me to send them their qualifications before they'll consider me? And I've written to X university and they haven't even replied to my letter. So someone like that, we didn't even have space to make a great organic intellectual because he taught himself informally, one of our professors, which is what he should have been. Um, I actually made a lot of notes, and that's why I'm carrying notes on Becky's career, but there is not time within this time frame to speak them, so I will go on towards the end and talk about how Becky saw us all in the universe. For Becky, where you were was absolutely irrelevant. He believed we'd all lived before and we were all going to live again and that those lives could be on Earth or on some other plane or planet. But for Becky, it was both faith and a lived metaphor. It took him to Hindu temples and Buddhist retreats and Sufic meditation places. It allowed him to consciously opt out of a world where music was commodified into genre boxes and sold by the pound and live his life the way he wanted to, which was sharing the light. And he very often said, I'm not a jazz musician. I don't know what that means. The industry invented that box. But contemporary South Africa really bruised him. Beggy's talent was sprawling and glittering and different and not easily commodifiable. Not commercial enough, he was repeatedly told. Only one album, the beautiful Home at Last album, came out of his time here. When he was sad, he didn't look after himself. He neglected his diabetes, which had been lifelong and undiagnosed, and that blocked his creativity a lot. The best way to remember Beggy, I think, is to remember all of him. Let's remember the earnest, committed, spiritual seeker, but let's also remember the mis mischievous deflator of pomposity. Let's remember the soaring musical genius. But let's all rem also remember the man who could groove that piano vamp on way back 50s that insinuated its way under the soles of your feet and made you dance. The UK critic John Fordham said of Becky, it sounded from one moment you couldn't tell whether he was playing for a dance or playing for an act of worship and sometimes he was doing both at once. And the absolutely best way to pay tribute to Becky is as Lindelwa has already said, to do what he loved and what he always longed to do, which was to teach and just to make good music. Thank you, Gwen. I'm obviously very um, sympathetic to Gwen's um, suspicion of, of genius, but then as you were talking, I remembered Albert Murray's considering genius. And I often wonder if we're too hard on ourselves as South Africans that we don't indulge in some of these less than academically sound ways of looking at things. Um, I want to thank Gwen uh, for what she's talking about in terms of the 1980s and um, the major ensemble and the life that was going on in exile in Botswana because in South African jazz history, the late 70s and the 80s remain somehow unnarratable. Um, there was just too much violence. We didn't have the story of Sophia Town. We didn't have the story of District 6. We didn't have any of these stories that anchored how we could talk. We didn't have the stories of Mkumbane, et cetera, et cetera. For somebody like myself, the 80s were important not only for the absolute horror in terms of fashion and Margaret Thatcher, but uh, they were also important for 
how they laid the foundation for what happened in the 1990s. Because people like Fea Fako came from somewhere. Yeah? People like Andile Anana came from somewhere. And the cauldron for all those experimentations and community-based music stuff, I mean, all the Nguganas, most of the Nguganas are gone now, and they were the ones who were really, from what I know from the cave, uh, who were at the forefront of teaching these guys. And they've kind of been sanitized into, let's all go to the Gramstown jazz school thing. And so what's happened is all of those thoughts, all of those ideas, all of those modes of organizing have kind of now been systematized and are now seemingly beyond the reach of ordinary South African musicians who had kept this music going for all these years. So the 80s are really important for that too. Eugene. Benediction for Pergim Selling. There was once a man whose inner ear was an atrium into the cathedral of the soul. Manzi, Utlanga Ugupi. I'll show you the Tarazelos again in point. Mosho, Sinis Verni. Begim Seleg, who was my best friend, was what uh, the English people call a bosom friend. He was my closest brother. I met him in the 70s at a time when I was working closely with Steve, Stephen Bandu Biko. I'd been a student. My parents wanted me to study medicine. I did it a bit. And then Steve Biko was expelled. A lot of us walked out in protest. And Bergi was the first phenomenal artist, irrespective of idiom, who I met. I introduced him to Steve Biko. And we were involved with people like Lefifi Tladi, Later on, the Malo poets, Kaya Matlangu, all those kind of people. But right at the very beginning, Begi, as Langa will tell you there, didn't have access to a piano. The first piano that Begi owned was bought at the recommendation of a mutual friend called Reg Hendricks, originally from Cape Town, but many years in exile, a friend of Abdullah Ibrahim's, Chris McGregor, and all those kind of people. Dudu Pukwana, Mongezi Feza, Louis Moholo, etc. And the piano was bought from the advance, as in those days when you signed a deal, you got a hefty advance. And Beggy used quite a massive amount of the cash, the first check, to buy a rare piano, an upright Steinway that the top. It's as broad as, if you're sitting at the keyboard here, it would almost be at the end of the stage there. That's how fat it was. Upright and had the sound of a nine-foot grand, Steinway. It's a very rare piano. I didn't know that one existed until I saw that one. Prior to that, Peggy had no piano. And the piano at their home would be locked. Eventually, it was chopped for firewood. And Peggy then cultivated a habit of practicing on anybody's piano at whose home he'd be allowed to stay. And once he got on the piano, it sometimes could take three days before you could get your piano back. My ex-partner, when I was sort of in hiding just before I went into exile, Mary Edwards had a little piano at a place where we lived in Beatty Street in Yeovil. Beggy would sometimes come there and his partner Nomvula 
Lombola and Lazulwane, the daughter of Victor and Lazulwane, would come there and Beggy would play for three days non-stop. People would take their kids to school, they'd come back, they'd go to work, they'd come back, Beggy would still be playing. We'd offer him food and he'd say, yes, please, and smile, that boyish, boyish smile of his. After three days, the top of a piano, not as broad as the Steinway I was describing, would be full of stale food and teas that weren't drunk, that had a thick skin on them. And he'd still just say, yes, please, thank you. And then we'd clear that and offer him more food after three days. His piano skills were cultivated even earlier than that, when Beggy would always be in the halls where bands were rehearsing. And Langa, it was the expressions, one of the first ones, yeah? Expressions. The band would be rehearsing. I'm here just to share a few stories. If I was to tell you all the stories, we'd be sitting here for three days. But I will just tell you a few stories that uh, illustrate the closeness between myself and Beggy and how we went into exile. So as a young man, he'd come and there'd be a band, like the expressions, practicing. And he'd just stand at the edge of the stage and watch. And one day, the pianist, the keyboard player, was ill. And Beggy told the band that he could play the songs. And he went there and could play the entire repertoire better than the keyboard player. When the keyboard player came back, thank you, let's hear it, yeah. When the keyboard player came back the next day, or a couple of days when he was well, he had lost his job. The next story I'd like to tell you is a true story, and I think I have permission because the person who is the central character of the story told me the story in London and gave me permission, therefore, to share it. Do you know the, the musician called Don Laka from here? Don Laka, I was instrumental in getting Don Laka over uh, by, uh, by way of uh, a UK slash South Africa artist uh, cultural project. Where, where artists go from the UK, they come to South Africa, and vice versa. So he was the South African artist coming to the UK a few years ago, and I was the artistic director of that. All of it was done under the auspices of the South African High Commission at Tra Trafalgar Square, South Africa House. Don Laka comes over, we look after him, and, and there's Adam Glasser, the son of Stanley Glasser. He's there with his harmonica as well and keyboards, and I organize the rehearsals, and... Uh, uh, some of Beggy's students were singing with Bini Sesol, the late Bini Sesol. Great drummer Frank Tonto, who used to play with Beggy Mselegu just prior to the release of the album Celebration. And we start playing, and the music's great, one tune after the other. We relax, we go for lunch. There's a lavish lunch laid on for us. And Don Laka just drinks a couple of glasses of some wine, and he's loose enough to start telling stories. He tells a story of, uh, in 1977, you know the story, you, you know when, when Begim Selegu went to the US to play Newport Jazz Festival with Philip Tabane and Gabriel Tobejani. So this was the deal. Again, like in the many situations that are too numerous for me to mention, I'm just cutting to this one because it's particularly interesting. Begi is at the edge of the proscenium stage of a hall where Philip Tabane has got his Gibson guitar and there's a piano uh, and, uh, that Don Laka is playing on. And there's, uh, 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 sorry, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Tobejane Mabi on, on drums. And that trio, Tabane, Mabi, Tobejane, and Don Laka were set to go to the States. Don Laka holds it until he can't hold it any longer. And he's compelled to go to the toilet. He goes to the loo, you know the rest. Beggy goes onto the piano. When, when Don Laka comes back, he has lost the job. <laughs> and that's how Beggy went to, you know that, Beggy was in, 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 that's in, when he went to Newport, and then he met Alice Coltrane and McCoy Tyner. You know who these people are, yeah? Alice Coltrane, John Coltrane, McCoy Tyner, the quartet. Alice Coltrane, loved Beggy so much, she gave him the mouthpiece of John Coltrane's tenor saxophone. I fast forward because there's not enough time. That mouthpiece was stolen out of Beggy's apartment in Durban. 
I, I lived with Baggy closer than most people, and we, we traveled everywhere, and that mouthpiece. When, when you see Baggy, on, 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 on my favorite album that, uh, that Gwen mentioned, uh, Meditations, there's a track where Baggy plays the saxophone and the piano together at the Bath Festival. I was not at the festival because I was then the earner. I was working with the London Philharmonic Orchestra as the, as the highest paid workshop leader in the UK. So I would work and get money, and my money would pay mortgages for our poorer friends. Peggy's family would get chicken and rice through my money. Another time when I'm down and Peggy's up, my family would get the same through his. So we shared like that. And do I have a little more time? You've got two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's what I was saying. Okay, so, so uh, to cut to the chase then, uh, w w w when Beggy, Russell Herman, uh, another friend of ours, was managing Beggy at that stage, and it was the DAT machine, the DAT recorder that was the thing used those days. He was the one who said to the engineer, press the record button. A hippie, long-haired engineer at the Bath International Festival. After Beggy lit the incense stick, incense, and put it in the hinge of the Steinway, he had been meditating all night at my home. Russell came to pick him up in the Kombi, the transporter, we took him there, and then I went to do my job with the London Philharmonic. When they came home, as we always did, he threw a stone at my window that was adjacent to the all-night petrol station and asked my brother, what do you want? And I'd say, some milk, blah, blah, blah. We had tea, I cooked food, we listened to the whole album, and I'm the one who said, that has to be released. The rest is history. Uh, um, I, I went into exile with Beggy when I fled after my passport had been returned and I was with my partner then, Mary Edwards. Beggy could not see a life without me in terms of the closeness that we had. It's a long story. So at the last minute, we bought him a ticket and we went out together. Fast forward, I, when we brought him back to London because life in Sweden where Abdullah Ibrahim had advised him to go turned out to be, to be not so good. Cut a long story short, when Mandela became president and we felt f cool to come back home, I wasn't ready yet. I brought Beggy back through a major project and then he settled in Durban. Still had the money from the deal. Many years later, being in touch occasionally, 2005, he, he calls me on a very crackly line and he's down and out, as these guys will tell you better than I could tell you. Wasn't treated nicely here, as my sister so powerfully says. You know, and he was down and out. I told him, stay on the phone, and I, I commanded, I, I dictated to him not to lose the phone because he was known to lose numbers and phones. He wasn't a guy, he just wanted to make the music like we, we hear. So I said, keep the phone. Straight after I hung up, I called my nephew, you know, and that's my sister over there, our nephew, Justice. I called him, I said, go to Uncle Peggy right now in your car and collect him, let him have a shower, take him to the airport, by which time I'd already bought a ticket to Heathrow. Got him to London in my car, took him home, my wife massaged him, we reconnected with Lombula, that's another long story, but suffice it to say that we fed him nicely, massaged him, and then I, I was a very highly placed guy in culture in the UK, and used my position to book a room called Henry Wood Hall, named after Sir Henry Wood, uh, and it had 12 pianos, 11 Steinways, and one Bussendorfer. And through my connections with the London Philharmonic, I got access at downtime for Beggy, this major hall with an organ and incredible acoustics, to have access to the piano to rebuild his chops, because Beggy had been neglected, and his piano, that, grand, that beautiful upright piano, had got pinched somehow. And I'm going to Durban to try and repossess it, and pay for, for it to belong to the family and the Begum Selegu Trust. Yeah, I'm finishing now. But in the hall, Begum uh, got access through the fact that the manager of the hall was the manager of the LPO, and he knew Begum from when I got the LPO to tour South Africa with Begum in 95, and they gave him carte blanche. The piano that he ended up liking was the 12th one, and it's the piano that belongs to the Russian uh, pianist and conductor Vladimir uh, uh, Ashkenazi. And I have footage that is going into my film about Beggy, where Beggy touches the piano, it's the very last bit, 
and 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 four, 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 three and a half minutes into playing that last piano with the light poised on it, we, we've unveiled the grand piano, lifted the lid, incense and his spiritual books. Beggy plays, and three minutes point something. He just hold the mic for me, brother. He, he, he does this. He looks at me and he goes, hey, my brother, it's painful because he hadn't touched a piano proper in a couple of years. So he, it pains him. And then he says, I need to practice this. And then he says, both in jie. And he goes. And what he plays there, these guys have seen it, is the most unbelievable piano, my sister Gwen. You understand, he's complaining of, of a physical incapacitation. But because of that spiritual thing, that, that, that vibe, Straight after that, he plays the most mesmerizing piano. Oh, I see you, my boy, Tuma. I didn't see you. That's Peggy's son there. You know, let's hear it for Tuma. Mselev, please. Yeah. And that's the kind of guy he was, you know. Thank you. Thank you. I think even an uptight person like me should allow those stories to continue. Uh, <laughs> Because if you're talking about 2005, three years later, I saw Becky, and I think it must have been one of the last gigs he played at the London Jazz Festival yes, the at the Chelsea 606. It was the, last it was the last gig he played. And I became a gypsy like him because I hadn't realized that trains from London to Cambridge stop. <laughs> and Becky, of course, wouldn't stop playing. And I we basically had to hang out at King Cross, which was, which was probably the coolest thing I've ever done in my life, and I'm not willing to do it ever again. But it, it reminds us, right, that once, by the time we see these guys, we're talking, dressed up in their suits or in their dashikis, sitting there giving us life, showing us options about how life can be better, beyond the banality, beyond et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot that's gone on in the background, and it's sustained by these kinds of friendships whose stories cannot be linear. So thank you very much. Thank you, my sister. Oh, okay. San Bonana. Yeah. Well, it, um, I'm, I am glad to be here. Um, I did not know that I would be, you know, like 95 or 98 percent of the stories that I'm hearing about Tubabu Peggy, I'm actually hearing <laughs> for the first time here in this, in this panel. This is very interesting for me. I don't know about you, Makatin. Um, I met uh, Babu Peggy well, probably twice in, in, in my life. Uh, my parents are here. They, they didn't want me to go out at night. I had to stay at home and, and practice. Uh, for one time, I snuck out. He was at Kipis. I, I must have been 17 or whatever. You know, and uh, he had a gig there. In fact, they got a, a, for the first time in my life, I saw, uh, I think, a, 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 a grand piano at Kipis I had never seen a grand piano at, uh, at Gippies, you know, and I can't remember who was playing drums, but they were all squashed in and then squeezing in and the, the, the bass player and everybody. But it worked, uh, worked out quite nicely. Everybody was there, of course, including Moses uh, Mulel. Everybody was there. Um, brilliant musicians were there, and I wanted to, um, <laughs> I, when I was young, I was a kid, and I, I wanted to say something as well or ask a question or, or play something for him and say, well, I could, how how could how can I do this better? Um, it was very very difficult to me because everybody wanted. But I was there, and everybody was. You know, yeah. um, <laughs> eventually, I got my moment. I can't remember what I. I, I can't remember what I played. It was a, a standard. Uh, yeah, one of those things. It in D flat, which is you know, or C sharp, whatever. And. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> You know, and, uh, and I was like, so what you think? Body, body and soul, that one, yeah. you know? And um, uh, I thought I had the nicest voicings and changes. Anyway, I was like, oh, yeah, you're doing well. You know, okay. Um, I was like, what? I was, so can you show me, a, um, could you show me, an, uh, you know, alternative voicings, you know, from here to there? All technical stuff. But I, and I need to know this stuff right now. And I, I know he was going to go back in a couple of days or in a week. So I, I mean, show me now, you know. And uh, 
I was very disappointed. That's the first time I met Babu Peggy. You know what he said to me? He said, he said you know, you know, about, 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 um, about, about, about Africa, you must breathe. I said, okay. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, boy, yeah, boy, yeah, boy, yeah, okay. Uh, I was like, okay, that's easy. You know? Uh, was, you know, we did a little bit of Tai Chi. With, it's, my, it's my brother here, Ubu Kwanza. We did some karate. I was like, okay. <laughs> so, okay. And uh, I was like, that. And then I played. It was like, no, 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 no. You, you, you must breathe. I don't, must have been 17, 16, 17. Anyway, I had no idea what he meant. I thought, you know, literally breathe. Okay. And I did that, you know. And, um, <laughs> but <laughs> remember, there's, there's other musicians um, around. I mean, it's like they're literally trying to be all beautiful musicians, but they're also trying to kick me out because they know he's going back to the UK in a few days. They also want to, you know, talk to him and, and jam and do all kinds of things with him. So um, I never... Um, I mean, that, that was it, you know, so I kind of like, I was very disappointed. Uh, do you know this number? Oh, one, one, six, four, eight, twelve, twelve. That's a meter taxi number, yeah. So I called it up. <laughs> this is before Uber, eh? Is it, eh? <laughs> so I called it number all the time. It was like, I said, I was like, I had to go home, you know. You know I was very disappointed. And so I could the number, six, four, eight, twelve, twelve. I'm, am I the only one who was using that number? <laughs> am I checking? Okay. Didn't have a license there. I, mean, I couldn't drive there. So, you know. um, anyway, so <laughs> um, I, I met Peggy. That's the first time I, I met Babu Peggy. Um, uh, second time he told me the same thing. It was at, at, his, at his friend's house. His friend's house was not far from my, f my parents' house. It was about three houses away. So sometimes when I knew he was there, I would go there. Um, and he, he told me the same thing. I, so I never really was never interested in talking to him anymore because he told me the same thing. Over. I don't know what he said to you, but to me specifically, <laughs> he told me that thing, you know, anyway. So. Um, but I was fortunate. I feel like someone that I've only met twice. I mean, met twice, not even intimately, you know what I mean? Like, just briefly, maybe it's not, more than, more, not more than seven minutes, you know? Maybe 15 minutes of my life I've met Babu Peggy, but I feel like I've, there's someone that I've um, known for, for a very long time, and I love what uh, Dr. Lindell, in terms of what you, uh, um, you know, his, his, his melodies, his music, uh, intrinsic, you know, even though he's a jazz musician, he doesn't consider himself a jazz musician, but you can feel that his melodies are intrinsic to whatever he does, whether it's jazz or whether it's this or whether it's that, that thing that, you know, the South African thing or whatever you call it. In fact, I hear a lot of Isimbondo, yeah, 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 yeah. more than Zulu, that, but that's my take on it. I hear a lot of, um, my grandfather was a, a sugarcane farmer in Bumbulu, and they used to have this, this place, they call it Ingombolo which means what, a, a compound, a hostel, you know. And it was quite strange because we're not allowed to interact with these, uh, these, these workers uh, and Gombol, uh, Mam -Mam and I don't know why, you know, this was in the 80s, I was very young. And uh, this was actually at, um, the compound was at my grandfather's youngest brother who just passed away a um, few days ago. But anyway, um, the music that I they, they used to sing there was so that beggy sounded like that. And I was like, I didn't hear a lot of Zulu that you know or 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 Ama Ihube, Amahube, whatever. It was quite interesting. I never understood why Beggy had more that trans guy, cis guy kind of sound or but anyway, that's something that you know, historians would have to, um, one has to uh, check that stuff out. Um, I don't want to talk uh, uh, too much, but I'd like to say this. I see there's a lot of, um, a lot of great musicians here. Uh, my cousin, Juan Dile, is here. Um, one thing I, I, I'd like to talk about is that I've learned a lot from playing his music, studying it, or, or just playing it uh, as a... Uh, uh, Professor Washington has alluded earlier. He, he, if you learn a tune like Cycle, 
which is exactly what it is. It is a cycle which would m start from one key, maybe move a minor third up or whatever. So by learning just one baggy tune, you would learn it in four keys because that's how it's written. So you become a better musician by playing a tune of Begum Selegu because you've covered four tunes. Now, if you have to play a tune written by somebody else, you, you are a better musician because you've covered all these, all these keys, you know? Um, so I find that, I mean, you don't have to be a jazz musician to, you know, to study his music or to enjoy it or whatever. I, mean, I think it's a wonderful study technically if you want to better yourself as a musician uh, because you could learn one tune and it's like you've learned that one tune in, in what, in six keys? In, in one tune. I find that to be, to be brilliant. Coltrane did the same thing, but melodically it was not as uh, tasteful. Music is subjective, but for me it was not as tasteful as, um, as, as Peggy uh, did it. Um, maybe because I'm also from KZN, I don't know. <laughs> if Train was from KZN, I don't know what I would say. But anyway, um, um, I am happy. Uh, I know it's a, a sad day, but I, I am happy that he got to do uh, what he did in his in his lifetime, I think he did uh, a lot. Um, he died. He, he passed on quite young, but I think he did a lot. And a lot of the musicians are, who are here at a uh, uh, bare testament to that. You know, um, all of us are. <laughs> I'm sure a week does not pass without playing at least. You know, one of his. Th you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so thanks, uh, Makatin. Yeah, my brother. What I really love about what you're saying is something that we really need to push in our music pedagogy, that jazz does not make sense only for jazz. Jazz is music, yeah? And the aesthetic choices that our musicians make teach us much more than just about this music. And you don't have to play Bach to learn all of these things. It's not as if just by knowing jazz or even South African jazz means that your knowledge is now necessarily circumscribed. And hearing people who have worked with the music, who have gone inside, is far more convincing than listening to cold musicologists such as myself. So thank you very much. <laughs> Hey, how was it? Hey, Sanmunan. Ah, siya bonga cool. Um, again, this whole idea of jazz in a workshop yesterday, and um, just reflecting on that particular workshop, I was saying to Babu Skiff, uh, maybe this would have been sort of a dream, sort of classroom, sort of approach or feeling that Babu Musele would have loved, where people feel a sense of community where people feel equal, you know? And one of the students raised their hands and they asked a question um, after we had played Timelessness, I believe. Yeah. And the, quest the question was, um, what sort of music are you guys playing? And, you know, so I wanted Wabuskif to give an answer, but for some reason he asked me to give an answer and I actually didn't have an answer. But the closest I could think of was, it's our music. So that's the music, that's the kind of music we play. It's the music that is born of our stories, our experiences, and I think terms, just in general, can be very problematic as well. But also that links to how I then uh, encounter Obama Um I got to Technicon Natal um, in two, 2001. And some of the first things that were given, f first of all, I didn't know I was studying jazz because like, <laughs> you know, I didn't know any jazz. So I didn't have an uncle that played records, so I didn't have that kind of background. So I knew Shembe, Isangoma, Amahu, Boy, Zayoni, you know, Istatamiya. Um, and also, I, I, we lived just before I went to, to high school, we lived in a place, uh, and it, it's literally because there were so many bears that would come every now and again, and all different kinds of birds, and they would really sing. And, and I think some of the first sort of uh, counterpoint lessons or or even like, you know, um, improvisation, sort of collective improvisation. Those were some of my first lessons. 
Uh, to my disappointment, I get to an institution that didn't recognize all of this knowledge. Not that it was great, but it meant a lot to me, at least in terms of how I defined my being an artist or my being a spiritual being, my being a musician. Um, so I come into a space where I'm told that I didn't have any musical background, and obviously I have to do something called foundation, I think we foundation or bridging course or something like that, they used to call it which I was fine, you know, doing that. But the idea that I didn't have any musical break background took me quite a while to sort of consolidate or sort of internalize in my system. Because I thought my family was one of the most musical families. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at these guys. They play only for 15 minutes, but I'm used to playing for hours and hours and singing. So, so I'm, I'm in that process where I'm trying to navigate all of these sort of meanings and definitions of what is to know music and, and what, you know, musical backgrounds and all of that. And um, we're given uh, a song called Yad Pursuit. It's, it's a Charlie Parker song. I think no one should give that to a guy that just came from the Zionist church as the first... <laughs> as the first song to navigate. I think it's a, it's a bit unfair at so many levels. <laughs> Not unless you say Charlie Parker and I a bass or something, but like, <laughs> I needed sort of like a context that was familiar, like how do I connect to this music? And, and, and um, I remember this one time really getting frustrated with this whole idea and going in and outside of, of class and, you know, just not really getting what the vibe was, and also starting to play piano for the first time. So it's, a, it's really a new instrument if you think about what it is. I mean, the keyboard was always there at home and my mom would play, but to call yourself a pianist is another thing. So, so then I, I go into the music library and I find, interestingly enough, I had been going and listening to different albums, Babu Billy Vans and, and all kinds of great musicians and I was looking for pianists because I just needed something that could answer. I think um, what I was really looking for was a music that would give me the same kind of feeling or something like that or so I was looking for a feeling more than so as a way of getting into this new genre and I found a love supreme which Shubabum Selegu was very fond of. And it was for the first time that I listened to a record all the way to the end with my eyes closed. And I just felt like I, I found something on this particular day. And in a couple of days, a couple of days later, I would meet Shubabum Selegu. Um, and I met him as just Ubaba that would come to the practice block. We used to have a hall called the Arthur Smith Hall. And it used to be really for third year students, so we're not really al allowed in there, um, except just for coming to listen to the other piano players or the people that were, were um, maybe doing third year, second year. And this one time I, I saw Baum Sele, I, I listened to him. And somehow there was like this connection between what I had just had, which is a love supreme, in terms of how his playing made me feel. And again, maybe, you know, that whole sort of notion of, of, of like, you know, the dialects and how maybe they connect to these musics. I had never heard, for instance, the, the Bondo music or these kinds of music at the time. But this really gave me the feeling of the music of my people. And, and I, I keep referring, referring to our music. But it gave me that sort of feeling. And um, I get to talk to Babum Selegu. Obviously, we couldn't have that I sort of exchange. He talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did. He did. Um, but, but, but I didn't have this. We couldn't have an, an exchange because I was just like, you know, starting out. And, and I don't even think I had. The kinds of questions I had were really silly to think of it. Uh, so the one question that I asked him was, so out of all these albums, because I, I got really fascinated, and I asked, so which one is your favorite? You, you need to have a favorite album. And he was a very humble human being, and he said to me, well, check out Star Seeding. And 
and, and, and I found that seeding. But back then, as Upanda will tell you, we, we, we didn't really own these CDs, so we couldn't check the liner notes, the personnel. So I got that on a tape, and I was listening to that for the longest time, asking myself, I wonder who's playing this beautiful tenor, but also I wonder who's playing guitar on this, and bass, and, and all these instruments. And, and later, I learned that Isbaum Selegu playing tenor, it's Baum Selegu singing, it's Baum Selegu playing the piano, and it's him playing the guitar. And, and, and maybe that's the one thing, uh, even in terms of the, 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 the studies that I've been doing, some of the things that I spoke about were maybe trying to construct a biography um, from very desperate sources as well, like, you know, um, obituaries, some articles that were written on him but also the, the whole inside, exile sort of sound and how it manifested in his music and spirituality, which was, is, is my biggest interest. But then we lack the language when we try to speak about spirituality. And, but that's also what's attracting me to try and understand Mselegu's modes of spiritualism and, and how we could start thinking of them, not just as a backdrop, but as a framework that we should start understanding Mselegu or, or some of the other artists that I'm interested in, in writing about, for instance, Ubabu Dabane, you know what I mean? So, so, so Ubabu Mselegu became this person that would help me sort of gravitate to creating my own definitions of this music, but otherwise I, I feel like I, I couldn't have access or sort of a, a context that I would connect me with how my people dance, for instance. So it was through Mselegu that um, I was able to relate to jazz. Thank you. I want to thank the panel um, for all these beautiful, beautiful um, perspectives that tell us not only about Becky Mseleku, but about um, music as such in this country and what we can learn about um, when we focus on people and give them time and I'd like to open up the conversation to the floor. Uh, we've got a little less than 20 minutes, but we can push it to 25 minutes. And thank you for giving us time to talk. It's equally important to talk about music as it is to listen to it. It's a different kind of engagement. Emmerich has got the roving microphone. Uh, please feel free to ask. We're going to take questions in rounds of three. Thank you very much. I, I wish we could, we could just co continue. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Sipos Tolle. Um, I don't have a question, but I wanted to also share the same thing that happened to me. I was heading up Gala Records, and Begum Selo came to see me. He was accompanied by someone else. I don't remember who it was. If you ask me, I, I wish Africa was here, what the meeting was about, I cannot tell. Because he arrives there, and we have a chat, and then he branches out to a different discussion because there was a plant in my office. He started explaining to me how important this plant is. And he started peeling leaves and smelling and explaining to me what the importance of this leaf is. And I'm trying to stay calm <coughs> and understand what Begim Seleg is saying. And the meeting was over. And, and, and he left. And I still wanted to know, was he coming for a recording deal? What was the purpose of it? That's just how deep and if I had listened to him carefully, probably I would have learned something about what he was trying to explain to me about life in general and, the, and plants and how they relate to us, the way he was explaining it. But I, I thought Undudu was going to tell a story that he's told me before that when they were hanging out with Begum uh, Selug uh, uh, in Natal Tech, they would rehearse at night and then they would go home. And then they will come back in the morning, they will find him still playing on the piano that they left him playing on. That's just how, wh wh what a person Begim Selig was. That's all I wanted to share. Dozo. I used to play piano as I started when I went to school. And Obabo Selegu, you know, used to come there and give us food and make us buy meat and say, meat is bad for you. And still give us the mind and we'll keep the change. And we asked him to come to his house at South Beach, me and Duduzo went there around 10 a.m. And he was doing his laundry and I remember that story very well because <laughs> we went in, 
He said, don't touch the piano. That's the first thing he said. And we're not, allowed, we're not even allowed to talk to him. He just gave us books. And he was playing some deep, um, uh, uh, deep uh, spiritual music. I didn't know what music it was. I think it was some Hindi something. And for someone, oh, cool, so oh, 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 you know, you think like that, it's like a demon. It's like, what is this thing, you know? Because you, we didn't know what it was that time. And we slept. We slept, my brother, remember? We slept and we woke up around two. And he says, this was your lesson. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to find out, regarding um, Babum Selegu as a composer, right? Um, how important were relations in his compositions? Um, did your relation with him deeply influence his writing, his composing? Um, yeah, that's my question. I'm Wandile. Um, for those who have played Beggy's music on stage, I really have a simple question, um, since you've really delved into it, harmonically, melodically, etc., all those theoretical terms. I just want to know, from your own personal viewpoint to his music, what do you think came first when he was composing? Do you think the melody came first, or was it the harmony? The answer to the first question about relations is a very deep and profound and intimate and personal one. And I'm quivering even as I attempt to answer it. Uh, I, I'm very anti, I'm very opposed to uh, projecting ego and stuff. I was very, very close to Peggy, and that was an amazing thing. Uh, Beggy flowed. The story I told when I was on the floor about him complaining to me about his hand aching for the first time because he could always just do anything. And that was from the neglect and age and, and, and the diabetes uh, that uh, was it Gwen mentioned and a lot of things. But as I mentioned that on the video, which one day you'll see when the film's out, straight after that, he plays some of the most mesmerizing piano I've ever heard. And Duduza will agree with me, they've watched it, and I showed a bit of that yesterday. So, uh, that's not directly answering your question, but I, uh, uh, in the 70s, in that home where we lived when I was in hiding before I went into exile, I used to do yoga and go into the the, 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 the wood just overlooking Johannesburg in Beatty Street, Yeovil, and, and chant and stuff. I would write lyrics for Beggy that were sung by Nomvula with Beggy at the piano. I gave titles to tunes for many years, and a lot of the music was composed in my presence, but not as if it was written for me. Myself and many other people, my partner Mary and other people who were with us, influenced the energy that Beggy there was a, a, like a recipro am I right, Gwen, yeah? Uh, 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 do you want to say something about that? Yeah. yeah. In Influence the space, and Vega picked up on that, and he flowed. When people were fooling around on that piano at the museum and discussing music, Beggy would do bits of composing, and it, it wouldn't be about either melody or harmony or even idea, but he would very, very often say, this one reminds me of so-and-so. It's like, it's light like so-and-so, or it's heavy like so-and-so. He very much thought of the human beings in his life as sources of inspiration, but it went through a sort of magical trans transformation and actually came out as music. It didn't come out as pictures of the people. It wasn't program music in that sense. It came out as music, but it started as thinking about people with whom he related, or somebody he'd just seen on the street walking in a particular way or something like that. He was very, very interested in the people around him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Duduza wants to answer the question about uh, melody, uh, melody or harmony. Ooh, really? <laughs> <laughs> the piano player and Carter. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I, I never spoke to Baum Selego about that, but just really thinking from how I experience his music, it sounds to me like it comes as a collective. Because even within his harmonic 
ideas, there are so many other melodies. I mean, we could think of a song like Monobisi, for example, which is, I mean, a, 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 a one for five situation that we've been playing for so many years. But the kinds of colors that he brings, and if you think about, I know you know his, his solo, and he starts with this harmonic thing, but there's always a top note. And I, I, I think I was talking to Ubabu Lucas Senya the other time, and saying this could be just one of the most beautiful sort of big band arrangement, his solo, his actual solo, if it was to be extracted for horns, for instance. But this is his harmonic side, and I think for him, I think there was no separation somehow, and I'm really thinking for him here, he maybe he would have had a, a different suggestion. But also just thinking about composition and the kinds of conversations I had with him. Um, for, for me, he, he sounded as if he, composition was just part of his remembering as opposed to, so, so like thinking melody and harmony. But it was just like something that was deep within him that he was sort of remembering. And some of his uh, songs as well, he had said he uh, collected from dreams, which I'm very fascinated about. Because, you know, growing up as well, I've, I've had so many melodies coming out of dreams and some bits that one is able to remember. I think he mentioned something on his documentary um, about through the years that the whole song just came from a dream like that. So I think when we think about it in, in that realm that sort of coexists with the physical now, it's, it's, it's really a matter of tuning in as opposed to composing. So Ubabu Kijaret will talk about objective music, for instance, and the idea that the music is always there, is constantly there. Um, composers are the lucky ones that are able to tap into that moment. But whether you compose or not, the music will always be there. And if you are in tune enough, you should be able to tap into those. So I think the separation is really for maybe when he was explaining stuff to students, because he used a lot of, he composed a lot of music as exercises and just like stuff that Ukabazel was talking about, moving between different keys. But I think at, at the core of his composition, it was just an alignment to a greater sort of cosmic music. Um, I'm very curious about how that um, tapping into those sources of otherworldly or outside um, influences um, reaching into um, realms that access spirituality. I mean, uh, Dr. Skiff has mentioned a few times the use of incense, for instance, um, during performance. Um, and I'm curious as to how that, um, how that process unfolded during apartheid, for instance, or during times when access to influence was very, to outside influences was very difficult. And then also how that relates back to more traditional practices of spirituality that are rooted in our context. It was participating in a tribute to Moses Molelegwa. And he said to me, make breathe in your best friend. And on top of that, he said, um, he reminded me that the space between C sharp and D, or the space between the notes, there is eternity in there. So go into the space, dive into the space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, um, he, he, he reminded me to find the silence between my thoughts yeah. as, this, as, this, as, a, as a, 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 a space where the soul lives, you know? Um, one of the questions I would like to ask, other ones will ask, uh, I'll ask in person, you know, when you meet, is uh, how can we honor him as South Africans? He's a great soul, he's a great uh, uh, contributor, both creatively and musically, uh, beyond music, you know, we have photographers who appreciate him. We have theater practitioners here who appreciate him. We have uh, uh, people of all different walks of life who appreciate him. But yet, there's still so much more to do around his uh, legacy, around his contribution. What, in your uh, experiences, do you think we still need to do? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, brother. When I was a young person, I used to fast for weeks on end when I was working with Steve Biko. I started driving at nine years old, those huge V8 cars, Buicks, Ford Fairlanes, you know, Chryslers, Cadillacs that my father bought out of poverty and, and then taught me to drive. So I was the getaway driver for the movement. I drove Steve Biko, the VW Kombi. 
and was not once caught by the special branch, branch when we were in motion. In order to have that facility, I did deep meditation and yoga and all those kind of things. When I was at Beggy, at, at, with Beggy, at some point Beggy liked, you know, was hanging out with guys, they'd throw the dice and then the switchblade and what have you. And Beggy wanted to go to a deeper place. And, and very, very, very early on, he met uh, Tu Nokwe, you know? And he was with Tu's family, the Nokwe family. You know about them in Durban? Wamashu. And Beggy would stay there and play the piano again for three days nonstop. They'd go to sleep and the dad would wake up to go to the toilet and he'd find Beggy still playing the piano and they loved him. And she also got involved with Beggy in a spiritual way very early on when she was still a teenager. So meditation helped Beggy to get deeper into spirituality and where then he ended up seeing himself as a conduit for the spiritual force or energy, you know, cos cosmic energy, call it what you may. And he saw himself as a conduit for that. So he was ever ready, like in the story I tell, where he just goes back and the pain just disappears, if you like, that encumberment, you know? Encumbrance, sorry. So he just played and was fearless. So much that one time, I told these guys a story yesterday, or whatever it was, that a, 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 in Brixton, in London, in the rough times, I was with Beggy on the streets. And, and a guy of Jamaican ancestry was about to beat up another young black guy. And Beggy just went there, and the man was a giant, and was totally fearless, and melted the whole situation, where the young guy who was about to be beaten up, was a, I winked an eye and asked him to leave, and Beggy changed, he transformed this gangster guy, and the guy just became soft. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, he, you know, he had this energy that came from just somewhere else, and he was a conduit for it. The, the reason that I'm here is Begim Selegu. I told you I went out in, to exile with him and I brought him back. So we completed, he wanted me to complete the cycle with him. I don't want to sound angry about this, but I'm a, a deeply hurt person when I see how badly Begim Selegu was treated here and continues to be treated. It hurts me profoundly. So I have a, a personal mission that I, I shall never rest. I will never find that moment of total stillness that we used to have. Beggy used to meditate in my home with a blanket at my piano. That moment, that, that state will not come to me completely until I address personally in conjunction with these beautiful people and all of you and the Mselego family. The fact that this country is guilty of neglecting, of being negligent towards the most creative force that ever emerged from here and went out. And he was known to, I was at Abdullah Ibrahim just a few days ago. They all knew Begim Selegu, Hugh Masegala talks about, you know, all of them. You know, uh, uh, Dennis Mpale, you name the names, all of them, you know. But he's not being treated beautifully. So I'm in the process, when I go to Durban, I've set up a, a, a non-profit company. I was instrumental in getting the tombstone with the family. That's what I did, when, when, when Langa could not even find the grave. Beggy himself was not into graves and that, but that's another story. But since we are here, we're dealing with that. So I'm setting up a Begim, uh, um, Selegu, a Begim Selegu Trust in conjunction with the family. We are still going to talk in Durban in a few days' time uh, with, with, with Langa. And, 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 and for in these academic institutions to honor him properly, I'm going to be in consultation with, with, with Salim there, you know, uh, uh, Salim Washington. So that's the small bit that I can do, is just to stir up the energy and, and you know, interact with people. Uh, we've got one more question. I'm Notemba, and my question really is not very different from the last question from the gentleman, uh, which has to do with also the fact that everyone in this room is here because they are the know about Becky, they love his music, they adored him, they uh, wanna hear these stories, they wanna hear his music being performed. There is something about Becky, that's why we're all here today. So question is, uh, without the likes of Emmerich and all you guys, you know, doing what you do, and outside of the formalized platforms which do absolutely nothing, 
you know, about these legends that we have that pass on and we have to do little things here and there to remind people, you know, who these people, how glorious and the kings and queens they have been to, to us musically and with their talent. What would you say when we all leave here, each and every person in this room must do in keeping the story of Beaky and the others like him alive. I don't know, the Americans seem to have an awesome way of celebrating their people where the young know their legends and celebrate them, but I don't know how we can do it in this country. I, I crossed the ocean to come live in South Africa. I, I hold it in high regard. I think it's one of the most amazing places on the earth. It is. <laughs> that being said, um, one of the things that South Africans have in common with African Americans um, is four centuries of settler colonialism and oppression. Not six or seven decades of colonialism like most of the continent, but four centuries. And with that comes a lot of things relating to Afro-modernity and so many things. But one of the things it means is that there is a very strong colonial kind of thinking that has to be fought, um, that has to be fought. So here I am t working in the African University, teaching about black music, and the curriculum, the pedagogical focus is Eurocentric, straight up and down. And I, I hear things that even in America, people would be embarrassed to say or do being propagated here in Africa. So one thing we can do is, is not to focus too narrowly, but to realize that something has happened, a historical process has happened. So how, how do we free our minds? How do we become more decolonial in our thinking across the board. In, in the, the big office at UKZN, they brought in this big painting of um, Beethoven. So I complained. I said, you know, nothing against Beethoven, but you couldn't identify Beethoven's music if I paid you to do it. <laughs> you know, this has nothing to do with Beethoven. This has to do with what you were taught to think about musical genius. So here we have Imseleko. Why can't we put his picture up? So what they did was they took the picture and put it right next to my office. They're, now, trying, to tell they're trying to tell me something. So now that would be embarrassing in New York. You couldn't hold your head up in polite society thinking <laughs> like that. And yet it could happen in Durban, right? So. The, the problem is much bigger than adopting the European habit of making artists more important when they're dead than when they're alive. It's more important than reducing them to a commodity. Uh, it's, it's, it, it is those things, but it's more than that. It's more than that. So if Becky can't be a professor, if Mankunku can't teach saxophone in an African university, then we, we, we have much larger problems then we realize, and so I, I, th I think we need to like redo the whole curriculum, and then other things will follow, I think. I mean, you could say a million things. You could talk about the colonial nature of institutions. You could talk about the disgrace, which is our media. All of those things, to answer Notemba's question, could be better, and that would help. But I would say something else completely. Read everything you can, listen to everything you can, 
and learn to behave like a free person and teach your kids to, and that's the best way to remember Becky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the importance of breathing, and we're gonna end by breathing and going back to music. I'd like to thank my panel again, and I'd like to thank this beautiful audience. Please stay for the music. Thank you.